just finished with regard to his decrees last time. And now let's we, we're about ready to move now to his providence, God's providence. What does that mean? Well, uh, he says that God is not only the architect of history, but also it's exec, you know, he executes it, right? He ensures that his plans are carried out per his designs. What he has purposed, he will do, Isaiah 46 says. This is what Paul means, he tells us, when he tells uh, us that God works all things according to the counsel of his will, mm -hmm. Ephesians 1.11. The moment God acts, things happen, <laughs> right? right? So God's providence is not a general kind of guidance, you know, kind of, you know, roping people in here and there, <laughs> yeah. as free will theists propose, he the, tells the, us. The, um the kitty lanes and, That's and right. at the bowling, you, you, you can't make them go in the gutter, but you can you can work what, within yeah, the scope yeah, of yeah, your yeah, ten yeah. bins. There, he says that is not the case, right. but it is a meticulous providence, right? A finely detailed, outworking execution of his decree in the temporal unfolding of history, whereby he superintends every event, action, and creaturely decision. Right, so it is meticulous. Right. right? So uh, good old John Calvin stresses that divine providence is a, not an idle observation by God in heaven of what goes on in earth. You know, he's not looking down and, and you know, TV oh, shows. I'll move this time. here and there. Yeah. <laughs> Giant chess pieces. <laughs> uh, or he's twiddling his thumbs and, and he's like, oh, wait, what was I supposed to do today? <laughs> oh, right. Kill off the dinosaurs. Yeah, something like that. But his rule of the world, uh, of, of the world, which he made, for he is not the creator of a moment, but the perpetual governor of mm. all things, mm -hmm. of all of it. The Heidelberg Catechism defines divine providence as the almighty and ever-present power of God by which God upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sorry, Vegas, uh, the, the, you, you may be the house, but uh, you don't uh, uh, exist in, in a house uh, div, uh, uh, separate from God. <laughs> and he tells us that historically divine providence has been understood by Reformed theologians to contain three dimensions. First, uh, government refers to God's specific guidance of history to achieve his desired end, right? That is what he decrees, which we talked about last time. Secondly, Preservation refers to God's sustaining power that lies behind the laws of nature. So he preserves his creation, right? We have, you know, such laws are, uh, you know, laws of nature are just simply uh, a way for us to ac accurately um, quantify, uh, qualify uh, the fact that he upholds the universe by the word of his power, says Hebrews 1 3, right? So that's preservation. And then thirdly, concurrence. And this indicates that God's uh, uh, normative manner of working through secondary causes to accomplish his designs, right? Including the laws of nature and the compatibilistically determined choices of human beings. So we have his providence that takes into account God's governs his universe. He preserves it. And then he works within it with regard to concurrence. That's the idea here. Right. Right. And uh, if you if if you've completed a what about evil, and you're like, you know what? I need another giant book to go on to. <laughs> uh, uh, if you go to cavetothecross.com slash blog slash providence or just look up John Piper's Providence. Uh, John Piper wrote a book called Providence. It's mm. pretty much the culmination of his life work. I have a spoiler free review if you can spoil the algae books. But <laughs> I, I, I like to, to, to give both highlights and not really low lights, but things that uh, I, I wish more of. Uh, I did a review of that book, and that book, I mean, just the first chapter alone is worth the, the price of admission. Uh, you, you get a full sense of what providence is, and then Piper walks through all of Scripture, and with the page limit that he has, which was almost none, uh, <laughs> he does all of Scripture, and from the Old Testament passages uh, right into the New and, and beyond. And so uh, I, I would definitely recommend that book if you're looking for more of this. Well, what is providence? Is providence just... Uh, happy uh, circumstances, uh, you know, the, 
the the soldier happens to find on the on the one dead spy that is in the field of all these dead soldiers the plans to the next battle is it always just a happy <laughs> accent or is there kind of more to it so recommend that book uh cavethecross.com if you just type in providence or john piper uh, you'll find it that way too so this indicates the ordinary means of his providence. At other times, God acts directly and immediately to accomplish his purpose, bypassing secondary causes. So he's the actor, and we see that within uh, the scope of Scripture especially and, and, and even outside that, but explicitly uh, expressed in Scripture, attributing it to who God is, the party in the Red Sea, that axe head floating, all these things. So this indicates his extraordinary providence. Such rare prov- providential actions include what we call miracles, that which uh, cannot be explained by quantifiable, natural, normal, repeatable processes, the laws of nature, which God is also in charge of. Right. So, so God works through secondary means, but he also works directly with regard to miracles. Right. right? That's the idea here. The, the providential actions of God, Christensen tells us, uh, include, you know, and now he's going to give us one of those lists, right? <laughs> right? The forest as well as the trees, he sets forth time, seasons, and sweeping epics, determining the status of the nations, places, where men will live and where kings will rule, right? He determines the time and place of all who are born and when and how they will die and what their station in life will be. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, it says, The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. So this is, you know, specific, detailed, meticulous things that God accomplishes through um, through his providential action. Right. All right. So when the atheist uh, asks you, well, you know, if you were born in Iran 300 years ago, you probably wouldn't be a Christian. You could say, yeah, probably not, because God uh, uh, does all these things, and he does it in the way, time, and place that he, he wants to. However, if he wants to make me a Christian, guess what? There are Christians <laughs> 300 years ago in yeah, Iran. Yeah. Who, who would have thought? <laughs> but he also acts in the insignificant and mundane realities of his creation. Oh, it's not just parting of Red Seas and and uh, fires coming down from heaven. <laughs> oh man, that, that's that's boring. He feeds the birds and cares for the lilies of the field. Not one sparrow falls to the ground unless God so determines. And so we apply that, or especially Jesus applies that in Matthew ten twenty nine to us, mm-hmm. saying we can have confidence that we're not going to be outside the scope of God's uh, uh, plan by uh, whatever foolhardy thing that we do. However, we want to act and do what God says so that we do things uh, joyfully in conjunction with him. There are no random arrows flying about, 1 Kings 22. God's universe contains no chance events. Chance is an illusion, an ill-conceived notion of a godless worldview. So, mm. uh, you know, um, uh, we tell people, you know, uh, oh, I'm going to go get that job. Well, good luck. <laughs> uh, whatever God wills, or, yeah, you know, we, we yeah. can gussy it up uh, that way. You know, uh, I'll see you tomorrow, uh, Lord willing. Uh, so we're just doing the same thing here. <laughs> yeah. 